So, what book have we been studying now for, this is May, isn't it? Yes. So this is our fifth month. The Bible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we can stop talking now, Dave. <laughs> Exodus. Yes, we're in Exodus. Where are we in Exodus? Like, you know, I'm giving the chapter and verse. I'm like, what topic? What have we been talking about in Exodus? The plays. I mean, really nice, uplifting, light, conversational stuff. Uh, and that's where we are today. We have looked at the first four. Uh, today we're going to look at the next four. How many plays were there? Good. I can remember. So we're dealing with what's really some very heavy, very difficult stuff to, to walk through in the Bible. Um, and so far, what we've been looking at... We've been trying to put ourselves in the place of Pharaoh. I mean, most of our, our tendency is to, to read these stories of the Bible. You know, if you're reading the New Testament, we're like the disciples, right? You know, we may be goof ups, we may mess everything up, but we're still the good guys. No, no. We're putting ourselves in Pharaoh's shoes because Pharaoh's reaction to all of this is really what we see in ourselves so much. Our reaction to our own... Um, Responding to God. So we're going to do that again today and a little bit. But I actually want us to kind of switch things up just a little bit. I want us at the end of this to come back and instead look at the mercy and grace of God through these plagues. Not what you necessarily think about. I mean, it's like judgment coming down on Egypt and all these things, in fact, these next four things really get ramped up. Uh, people die, animals die, and it's just a bad situation, which is why I want us to come back and look at the grace. Because through all of this, God is still revealing his goodness, his mercy, and his grace. All right. So, fair warning, we have a lot of scripture today. And what I'm going to do is we start out, I'm going to weave um, our look at Pharaoh and his reactions and ourselves in that. I'm going to weave that in as we are reading so I can come to the end and just focus on God's mercy towards us. Got it? So we're going to start in, the, uh, in chapter 9 and we're reading through the first half of chapter 10. So Exodus chapter 9. So we've had four plagues so far. What were they? Yes. Frogs, snaps, flood, blood, and flies. So we had, first the Nile was turned to blood, then you had whatever those biting, digging insects were, then we had, wait, no. First we had flood, then frogs, then the biting insects, and then the flies. It's not been a great time to live in Egypt. And Pharaoh so far decided he was going to endure one, and then he was going to lie and try to get out of one, and uh, then he decided negotiation was his best route, just like we do. Sometimes we're like, we can endure what God's sending our way because, you know, we can just live through it. Sometimes we're going to say, okay, God, if you only, I will, and then we don't. And then probably a lot of times we like to negotiate with God. Let's see where he goes, starting in chapter 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and speak to him. Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock which are in the field, on the horses, the donkeys, the camels, and all the herds and flocks. But... The Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. Now we saw this in the last plague with the flies. God had started making a division between the people of Egypt and the people of Israel. He was not letting his plagues touch not just the Israelites, but the whole land of Goshen and anyone who was there where the Israelites lived. And God is showing he's got the power not just to send these plagues, but to limit them as well, which is just an amazing thing to consider. And then the Lord, he said a definite time, saying, Tomorrow, 
the Lord will do this thing. And so the next day, God did, and all the livestock of Egypt, all the livestock in the fields of Egypt, died. But the livestock of the sons of Israel, not one died. And then Pharaoh said, he went and sent people to find out, Behold, there was nothing left. Uh, behold, there was not even one of the livestock of Israel dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he still did not let the people go. So this is the first of four really devastating plagues. Before, I mean, they attacked comfort. They attacked their idea of, of who they were and everything they based their, um, their security on. But this has just financially devastated Egypt. I mean, a, a country was based really in two things. It's livestock and its ability to feed itself. Now, it, uh, Egypt was also known because they, was, they fed a lot of the world. Uh, this is a huge blow. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves handfuls of soot from a kiln, and let Moses throw it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and it will become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast through all the land of Egypt. Okay, so this is another one of those where there's no warning. Uh, Pharaoh had said, make it stop, and I'll let him go, and no, and this time he's like, okay, I'm not even going to acknowledge this last plague. I'm not even going to bring it up. And so Moses, the only, the only warning Egypt gets is that he has his handfuls of ashes, and he, you know, make sure he makes eye contact with Pharaoh and then throws them into the air. It's just really bad. Interesting, though, what's a kiln? A furnace, a kind of oven. What do you what do you bake in a kiln? Pottery. Pottery, specifically bricks. What did the uh, Egyptians make the Israelites do? Make bricks. So, in a way, he's going and he's saying, "Okay, you're not going to respond, Pharaoh. You're not even going to call Moses back like you have. I just want to remind you." I'm going to remind you, this is all my response to what you've been doing to my people for a generation. Okay? So they took soot from a kiln, they stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it to the sky, and it became boils, breaking out from sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as all the Egyptians. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen, just as the Lord had told Moses. And then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the I Am, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you. In case you thought he was holding back. I'm going to send all of them on you and on your servants and on your people. And again, why? So that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. Guys, these boils that they were, were sent on the people, this is the first plague to directly affect the people. I mean, all the other stuff was uncomfortable or worrying. Um, but this actually touched the people. It still wasn't deadly. But it was excessively painful and irritating. And God again reminds us, what's his purpose here? So that the people would know there is no one like the I Am. No one like Yahweh in all the world. And then he clarifies for Pharaoh. For if by now I have put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, basically like you did the animals, you would then have been cut off from the earth. God is telling Pharaoh, I've been really easy with you. I've been slowly ramping up. And you need to realize, I could have wiped you all out by now. I could have just cleaned you out and let my people walk out unhindered. But for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. God has not yet taken Egypt out, 
taken out the people because he wants them to know who he is too. I remind you from a few weeks ago as we looked at Revelation and it talks about people from every tribe and every tongue and we saw specifically talking about the, the people redeemed out of Egypt. God saves Egyptians. This is not just God against the Egyptians and just for the Hebrews. God's making his point and he wants his name known, but he also wants to be proclaimed in Egypt. But, and this is why it keeps going, still you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. So behold, about this time tomorrow, I will send very heavy hail such as not been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Therefore, send to your people, tell them, bring in your livestock and whatever you have in the field, every man and every beast that is found in the field tomorrow and is not brought home, when the hail comes, they will die. So those among the servants of Pharaoh who at this point feared the word of the Lord, there were a lot of them, I guess, they brought their, house, their servants and their livestock back into the houses. This is what was left after that first plague. But those who had no regard for the word of the Lord left their servants and their livestock in the field. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky that hail may fall in the land of Egypt on man and beast and every plant of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And so Moses stretched out his staff and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire that ran down to the earth. Now, just to the side, personally, a lot of times when you hear this fire and hail coming down, I tend to think that the fire is lightning. Uh, in a minute, here's going to, yeah. And the Lord rained hail in the land of Egypt, so there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. Flashing fire sounds like lightning to me. That just makes more sense, but um, I haven't seen either of these. I wasn't there. Uh, it was very severe, such as had not been seen in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck all that was in the field throughout all the land, both man and beast, and also the hail struck every plant and shattered every tree in the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, was there no hail. Then Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron, and he said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the wicked ones. Pray to the Lord, for there has been enough of the thunder and the hail. I will let you go, and you will stay no longer. Okay, did Pharaoh just repent? Hey, you're not answering because you're afraid that you'd have the way. You're right, on face value, you're saying, hey, this is exactly what we want. But was it genuine? How, how do you know it was genuine? What did he do afterwards? He changed his mind. Yeah, he didn't keep his word. We're going we're gonna to come back to this because he's going to do the same thing after the next place. We'll talk a little bit more then in just a second. But Moses said to him, okay, as soon as I go into the city, I'll spread out my hands. I'll talk to God. The thunder will cease. The hail will stop. That you may know that the whole earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord. Yeah, Moses wasn't at all. He wasn't surprised. He's like, yeah, you're just using the words. You're just playing the game. You're not really repenting before the Lord. Now, here's an interesting fact here then in parentheses in my Bible. Now, the flax and the barley were ruined. Flax was where they got a lot of you know, some of their cotton-type stuff. Um, Egypt was well known for. Uh, barley they used for food. Uh, for the barley was an ear, the flax was in bud. But, this is important, the wheat and the millet were not ruined because they ripened later. That's significant. We're talking about the mercy of God coming up here. You know, the livestock getting killed broke Egypt financially. And the hail coming could have just utterly destroyed Egypt, period. They would have no food left. But mercifully, God sent this plague at a time between 
when the, the wheat and the millet would be destroyed because they had also come to head and the other stuff had come to head. He put it right in the middle on purpose. So Moses went out from the city and spread his hands and the thunder and the hail ceased and the rain no longer poured down on the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not let the sons of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Have you ever dug in against God? Yeah. You know where you're like, you know what he's telling you. You know what he wants, and you're like, no, I'm not going to listen. I'm not going there. Just know I'm not going to do what you demand. This is my life. This is my choice. You know, you're so mad at God, you just don't care what the consequences are going to be. That's what Pharaoh is. Pharaoh ruled as a god in his own nation, and the real god showed up, and it's just knocking down his house of cards left and right. And every time... Pharaoh's like, okay, this has got to be over. It gets a little worse. Pharaoh is, is being defiant before God. I remember as, as a young parent, as Kim and I are trying to understand, how do we raise kids? And so we're, we're looking at some of the stuff that Dobson wrote. And Dobson's like, okay, you know, kids do need to be spanked at times. The, the, the Word of God you know, says if you Spare your, the rod on your child, not that you spoil them, it says you hate them. Like, oh, wow, I don't want to hate my kid. It's like, but you don't want to spank your kid just because they annoy you. If you're going to spank your kid, it needs to be for some very specific reasons. And Dobson talks about being defiant. That's where your kid knows what's right, knows what's wrong, hears and understands what you told them, and they're like, not going to happen. You know, that's when. As a parent, I'll just tell you that that fire starts burning. That's what's happening here. God is telling Pharaoh, this is what has to happen. And Pharaoh's going, not going to do it. Okay, I'll do it. And I tricked you and you made you stop. And over and over and over, Pharaoh is really asking for it. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart. He in three just three times in a row. Pharaoh hardened his heart. His heart was hardened. I have hardened his heart. It all blends together. I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, so that you may know that I am the Lord. I find that interesting because so far all along, God keeps telling us over and over, the reason I'm doing this is because I want all the world to know, I want Egypt to know, I am the Lord, I am God. And right here in the middle of all these plagues, God throws out, he just kind of turns and he says, I've also done this, so you would know, so your children would know, so your grandchildren would know, and I want the line of Israel to know that I am God. And I want them to know it because you tell them what has happened here. I tell you, I have uh, the opportunity when stuff is going on and uh, rough stuff going down in somebody's life, uh, I get asked the question, why? A lot. And I try to help people and we examine what's going on in their lives. I, I ask questions. We try to piece everything together. But we really have to remember even when it seems obvious in our lives, even when we have a clear word from God, this is why I'm doing this, that's only, rarely the only reason why God is doing what he's doing. I tell you, God has plans within his plans within his plans. Sometimes we get to know a part of that, but a lot of times we don't. But this piece right here, this piece that he just shared with Moses, is always there. Whatever else is going on in your life, whatever else, whatever, whatever purpose 
he has in what he's moving and speaking to you, this purpose is always here, that you may tell others and know that I'm God. You ever have to ask why? And you can't find any other answer. You can go there. Why is this happening? That you can know he is God and tell others what he's done in your life. Going on. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into the land. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see it. They will eat the rest of what has escaped, what is left to you from the hail. They will eat every tree which sprouts in the field. Your houses shall be filled, the houses of your servants shall be filled, the houses of all the Egyptians. This is something neither your fathers nor your grandfathers has seen from the day that they came upon the earth until now. And then Moses turned and went out from Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long will this man continue to be a snare to us? Let the men of Israel go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? Wow! I mean, how bad has it had to get for the, the, the chief leaders in the land of Egypt to tell Pharaoh, make it stop. We're done. I mean, it is it's a life or death thing. You don't go up to Pharaoh and say, hey, bright boy, stop. Because you're going to die, right? And these guys are at the point of, it's dead or dead. Maybe I'll get lucky this way. We've already figured out when you go up against God, it's not happening. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Because <laughs> his leaders had said, work something out. And he said to them, go, serve the Lord your God. But who's going? Has he told Pharaoh who's going before? Has he been unclear and, un and, and you know, difficult to understand. No. So Moses, once again, we shall go with our young and our old, our sons and our daughters, and our flocks and our herds, for we must go and hold a feast to the Lord. And Pharaoh said, Thus may the Lord be with you if I ever let you and your little ones go. Hmm. Take heed, for evil is on your mind, but not so. Now go the men among you only, and serve the Lord. Because that's what you really want to do. And then he had them driven out of his presence. Is God going to take the, uh, the compromise here? No. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt to the locusts, that they may come and eat every plant, even what was left by the hail. So Moses did that, and the Lord brought an east wind, and all that day, all that night, and when it was morning, the east wind had brought locusts. They came up all over the land of Egypt, and they settled, settled everywhere. They were numerous, you think? There had never been so many locusts, nor would there ever be so many again. For they covered the surface of the land so that it was darkened. They ate every plant and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left, and there was nothing green left of tree or plant all the land of Egypt. <clears throat> and then Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron. And here it is again. It says, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and make supplication to the Lord for me that he should remove this debt from me. So again, is it real repentance? The way you can tell real repentance results in obedience. He's just remorseful over the consequences. I mean, this, this is what our kids do, right? When they get caught, what are they upset about? They're upset about getting in trouble. It's 
It's like when you make your kids, go tell your brother you're sorry. We know that they're not sorry. We're teaching them to practice so they can learn they're supposed to be sorry. Pharaoh's not sorry. Pharaoh's almost broken, but not yet. <clears throat> Moses went out and he prayed. The Lord shifted the wind, and the wind turned to the west and blew the locusts out to the Red Sea. Not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go. I told you there's a lot of scripture. Notice there at the end, he didn't say that he wouldn't let the people of Israel go. He wouldn't let the sons go. Of Israel, the men. Again, it's that compromise he just tried to force on Moses. He demanded, "Hey, make the plague stop, and I'll let all the men go." Real repentance is evidenced by obedience, and it's evidenced by submission. That's why God asked, "Hey, Pharaoh, how long are you going to keep going like this and and not humble yourself before me?" saying the right words, uh, but he's not humbling himself. And because of it, it has led to Egypt's destruction. You need to understand, the first time with the hail, God spared food. Egypt would have had a rough year, but they wouldn't have starved. Now all the food's gone. The land that God saved from famine through Joseph is now going to face famine by God through Pharaoh. This is Pharaoh. This, this is us thinking that we can endure God's judgment rather than repent and turn from our sin. This is us choosing to lie our way out to try to negotiate with God and find some compromise where he stops his judgment on our lives, and we still get to keep our sin some way, somehow. This is us in Pharaoh, where we repent because of the suffering our sin is causing us, but not actually repenting of the sin, and obstinately digging in and being defiant before God. Pharaoh will not bend. Going to be broken. This is why, over and over in his word, God warns us God opposes the proud. You may recognize that from a, a passage in 1 Peter, but in fact, that's like seven times in the Bible. God opposes the proud, but it comes with a promise, too. But he gives grace to the who? The humble. Therefore, humble yourselves. For the Lord. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But first I want to look back at these horrible plagues. There are two more to come. And I want not to look at the judgment, but at the goodness and mercy God offers to all of this. Because honestly, if you talk to people, and, and people who don't believe God, who are not following God, the plagues of Egypt are one of the places where God gets some really bad press. It's like, look at what he did to all these people. He, he's cruel, he's mean, he's vindictive. I mean, how many people had to die for him to make his point? Let me remind you where we started in this. No one is innocent. No one. For a generation, Egypt has been trying to work the Hebrews to death and we don't know how long Pharaoh had this whole throw the baby boys into the Nile going on. No one is innocent. The judgment was deserved. But, even so, even that the judgment is well deserved, God in all of it is still good and merciful throughout all of it. Let's go back to those first four plagues. They're nasty. They're uncomfortable, but there was not a single harmful thing happening. Piles of rotting dead frogs, dead fish and blood in the Nile, bugs everywhere. Sounds like a bad day in Kansas. 
But time and time again, God acts, and then he waits for Pharaoh to respond. He didn't just throw all of us at him all at once. He started and he waited. God would tell him, if you do not do what I'm demanding you do, this is going to happen. You know, like we're told as parents we're supposed to do with our kids. Don't just like out of nowhere come up and, you, are you're grounded. Why? They need to know why. God told them every time, this is what's going to happen if you won't let my people go. And then, even further evidence of God's mercy in this. Every time Pharaoh says, please make this plague stop, what happens? He stops them. Every time. He doesn't even get to faith repentance until later. Every time he's like, please go pray that this would stop. God's like, okay. And then God waits. What are you going to do? And when he does it, he's Sends another one. God is so gentle. He stops his plagues even though he knows Pharaoh is not going to keep his word. God warns every time, all but two times. He warns Pharaoh, this is what's coming. This is what's going to happen. He even Someone seems to accept this false repentance. He stops those plagues and he waits to see if Pharaoh is going to follow through. But he doesn't. And even in these last four plagues we've looked at, God keeps showing his mercy. The first one, the livestock gets sick and dies. But it's the livestock in the fields. What do you keep back home? What's staying in the, in the barns when everything else is going out? Probably all your youngins, all your little new young animals and the mamas. There's still a way to start over. They're not all dead. It's serious, and yet God who could has not killed everything. And he hasn't brought it to the people yet. Then when he does, and he actually touches the people, he lets the plagues hurt and affect them, it's still not fatal. It's these, these boils and this pain and this, this everything that just shows, hey, it could be worse. In fact, God says, hey, I could have wiped you out. By the way, let's throw some ashes in the air and remind you what you did in the first place. God is being extremely kind in the progression of these, these plagues. When he sends the hail, he's like, hey, this is coming. Everything outside is going to die. Get inside. And even then, when he sends the hail, he spares the food supply of the nation. Yeah, people died in the hail. But the nation would still be able to go on. And when Pharaoh still refuses to obey God, before it comes, God is explicit about how far the next plague is going to go. Every green thing is going to be gone. Every last hope, every last independence, every last bit and scrap of we can make it on our own is going to be gone. All before he did. And yet through it all, God spares the land of Goshen and the Hebrews. Why did he do that? Did he spare them because he loves them more? We think so, but no, we know from the rest of the Bible, that's not how it is. Were they better than the Egyptians? No, in fact, when it came to throwing babies in the Nile, there's a good chance most of those babies were snatched up by other Hebrews. They're just as guilty and just 
as, uh, as deserving of judgment. And then the Hebrews, let's just remind ourselves, God, they cried out to God, save us from this terrible life and slavery. And when they, when God actually steps in and he's going to save them, what do they do? How do they respond to God's moving? They complain. They complain. They're going to do a lot of that. Just wait till we get into the desert. They complain. They get mad. They blame Moses. They blame God. Guys, they are not any better than the Egyptians. And you and I aren't either. It comes down to grace. God was extending grace to the Egyptians even though Pharaoh wouldn't claim it. God covered the, the uh, Hebrews with grace even though they didn't deserve it. God holds his grace out to us even though we don't deserve it. Let me read for you a painfully jarring passage from Romans, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. What shall we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? Implied question, implied answer is no. May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. He's talking there about a story we'll read later. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For scripture says, God said to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then God has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. That's Romans 9, 14 through 18. That's some rough stuff when we start asking questions about our own concept of free will. And guys, I believe the Bible teaches free will. I believe the Bible says we do have a choice and a responsibility. It's not an illusion. But the Bible also teaches that God is sovereign and that mercy and grace are in His hands alone. Not really digging into that except to point out this one thing. Even in His judgment, then and now, we can see God's exceptional mercy. God could have done a million other things to get Israel free from Egypt. He chose this route. He chose it to exalt himself and to make his name known throughout the world by means of this mighty battle with Egypt. And yet, every step of the way, God held out mercy and grace to everyone. The proud, the prideful don't see it. And they don't receive it. But to the humble, that grace is there and it is life. First Peter, this is that verse I said is in like seven or eight different places. First Peter 5, 4 through 6. When the chief shepherd appears, who's that? Yeah, that one's really easy. That's the church answer. It's just Jesus. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory, okay? Be subject to your elders. Clothe yourselves in humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you at the proper time. God's grace is to even through these, these plagues, even through everything that's been thrown in Egypt, he is holding out grace. Pharaoh in his pride doesn't see it, doesn't receive it, turns away from it. Any in their humility who saw and accepted and humbled themselves before God received it. And that's still true of us. We've got two more plagues coming up. Now let's get in on a little secret. When we 
see them next week. If you want to, to have some interesting reading, jump over to the book of Revelation. Because what you may or may not know is everything in these ten plagues that is laid out, God turns around and does again in the book of Revelation. When it's all said and done, the judgment's not just on Pharaoh and Egypt, it's on the whole.